Okay, thanks very much for the introduction. <clears throat> I'm a little sick this afternoon, so uh, bear with me if uh, my speech seems a little bit noisy uh, for your speech recognition systems. Um, you can find the slides if you'd like at this uh, URL there. So I'm from NUS, uh, from Singapore, so I think uh, quite a number of you will be making the journey back down south, not too, not too uh, long uh, away, and I hope you have a chance to visit our campus like we have a chance to visit USM uh, later tomorrow. So I want to start a little bit by talking about the process of research, right? A lot of us here in the room are professors or graduate students, and we have our undergraduate charges or our graduate students to uh, try to um, teach about research. So there's a lot of different processes involved. Uh, first, we start with the enthusiasm. Oh, I, I'd like to do research. I'd like to figure out what that is, uh, discovering what a new science is. And then finding, wow, Google Scholar has that many pieces of literature on my subject? You know, there's some anxiety. How do you focus down and uh, come down to a narrow uh, patch of work that you think you can meaningfully contribute to? Um, trying to understand that. Uh, and then you know, do the codified work to compare your work versus others. And then you know, report that work, right? Write it up as a publication have it turned down by uh, journals and, and conferences for a couple times until it gets accepted, right? And then uh, distilling that, uh, making uh, your slides for your presentation, saying, what is the 20-second you know, sound bite that I can provide you know, all of you in the audience with to remember what my talk was about? Because certainly you're not going to remember my face anymore. Or if I do it really bad, maybe you will. Um, but also communicating that to others, right? Uh, sharing your discovery, making yourself known uh, that you're doing that work. So this actually has to do with, you know, sort of an hourglass shape in terms of a breadth and depth, right? You start out very wide, you have lots of different possibilities about what you can do, and it can be very scary for the beginning undergraduate or graduate student to say, uh, what is my problem actually? I don't know. Uh, my researcher, uh, my, my uh, supervisor hasn't defined it for me. And then finally communicating it. A lot of people feel that, oh, when I've made my publication, let's say I've uh, published in SLAM, a very uh, prestigious conference, my work is done, people will discover my work, people will cite it, and that's so untrue, right? We all know that there's a lot of work to do in marketing your uh, research, making it well known to others so that you can uh, be understood as contributing to society. So I like to think of research as really an apprenticeship process. It's not something that you can do um, through textbook learning. It's something that we do by observing others, right? So we observe others by searching for papers. We observe others by reading their papers. Um, also, uh, at some point, writing, uh, listening to presentations like this one, um, talking about it. Uh, again, as a supervisor, I'm so lucky to be learning so much from my students, right? by just sitting there and listening to them talk about deep learning or whatever the new aspects of, of uh, speech processing or signal processing are. And also by doing, right, uh, doing the uh, experiments, uh, demonstrating how to carry out experiments, what are the best practices, and creating, right, creating data sets, uh, creating tools, and then teaching it, coming to a full circle as a lecturer or um, at a, a communication session like this, being able to tell others. So I'm going to start by uh, having two parts of my talk. I'm going to talk about opportunities in the digital library for uh, this type of work to happen. Um, and I'd like you all just to take a minute to think about your favorite digital library. Okay? What is a digital library and what do you do with it? Okay, when I survey students in my class, this is the answer they tell me. Right? A database of PDF files for reading. Now, as a natural language processing researcher, that really irritates me, okay? Because uh, we all know PDF files are just files, right? There's actually a lot of knowledge in those files. Why, why are we treating them as atomic elements in a database, right? Does that make any sense? You know, we, we have papers that we get a search result from, but we don't bother to introspect what's in those papers, right? To do that requires you to read. Oh. Sorry, our machines aren't powerful enough to tell you anything about the paper itself. We just know how to search for it by abstract and title words. That's about it. So uh, 
I think that's not very um, a good use of, of scholarly material that all of us in this room are creating, right? We're creating a corpus, right? A corpus of language in whichever language we publish in, uh, whether it's English, French, or German, or Chinese, or Malay. Uh, but you know, people have been trying to figure out how, how to improve that. So librarians have, and, and end users have thought, OK, maybe what we can do is support reuse. We're going to make it easier to cite works. We're going to uh, easier to create reading groups around work and annotate. And computer scientists, while being narcissistic as we are, um, we like to find out about the prestige of others, right, ourselves. So we uh, in, uh, look at citation count. We look at uh, being able to fac facilitate finding authors and papers. All of those are really important, but I'd argue that we're leaving out a very special group of people. Those are the people who need to read our papers. Huh? What happened about those? Right? Let's say you are a, a postgraduate student or an undergraduate, and you're you know you're really excited. You got attached to this big professor, and um, uh, you want to contribute to society. And they throw you into the lion's den, right? They say, "Oh, read these twenty papers and tell me what you think," right? And then you download them. And I think we can all remember when we were at that point in time, when we were first reading our first research paper. Nothing made sense, right? And now a days we have things like Google Scholar. Still nothing makes sense, right? Because you look up things, there are zillions of papers, they all match, but your professor comes back and says, these aren't the papers you should be looking for, right? Because they're not by the right people, they don't use the right terminology, all these things. So my group is very interested in this particular problem of observing how undergraduates and graduate students deal with the problem of using our own scholarly communication, right? So, of course, there's some obvious directions we can go. We can build a platform for collaborative annotation. Let's take a PDF file, and, and we, we, uh, anyone who's done any work with PDF will know this is a much hated format, right? Because uh, you can print it. It doesn't print very well sometimes, but try to get text out of a PDF. Good luck, all right? Um, but in any case, what we'd like to be able to do is say, if we can do that, what types of things can we do? Could we make uh, an annotation tool that's not at the document level, but drilled down to specific levels for uh, lines and comments. Could we offer highlighting? Could we offer annotation? And uh, could we use our own machine-readable tools as scientists in the speech, language, and audio community to help us annotate those? Right? Could we do keyword extraction or keyword spotting? And could we insert that in an annotation into these documents, which we care a lot about. I mean, I know I spend hours and hours, and, and my PhD students spend days and days writing their papers. Couldn't we treat that with a little bit more care? Okay. So uh, one part of the problem that uh, we think is important to look at is full text mining. So we have databases of abstracts and databases of titles and offers, but the full text is where all the business is at. Right? So in particular, we have this project It's called Argumentative Zoning. It is to find the argumentative or discourse purpose of a sentence in a paper, a scholarly paper. This is rel relatively limited to computational linguistics and nat natural language processing, but I hope you get the idea. So we have colorized sentences here, right? Um, and you can see they're colorized in a certain way. So for example, uh, the pink sentences are aim sentences. They're what the paper aims to do. Okay? Now you can say, that's already in the abstract. You know, why, why do I need to, to look at the full text for that? And I argue that you know, the abstract has only a limited amount of information that is in uh, that, uh, the abstract that talks about the aims of the paper. There's in fact a lot more, you know, uh, there are many times in which people create data sets, people create tools, but what they, when they write this particular piece of text, it's all about the method, right? Because we get published for methods, we don't get published for data sets, although the community is changing on that. Okay, other things that we want to find out, what's the background knowledge that uh, people need to read this paper? What are important contrasts? Uh, where do we contradict the previous work? Right? so that we can build a network of how uh, evidence is structured. Right? And of course, most of the paper is about the own contributions of this researcher's findings. 
So this is actually a really, really simple N-way classification system. It's a natural language-based system. Um, it's based on, you know, simple things like maximum entropy classification, conditional random fields, and there are no surprises here. But what I'm trying to tell you is that these basic technologies that we are all working on for our domain-specific problems can be helpful for ourselves, right? We can use them and uh, fire our own guns on our own literature, right? So uh, we use lexical features, we use information about sentence position, uh, cue phrases, as you know, cue phrases will help a lot to determine what type of class of sentences it is. When we look at specific domains, though, when we say, like Sri did in his keynote, we try to look at other places where we can help. Uh, it becomes much more interesting and much more rich. So, for example, in math, all right, so talk about math search. What does it mean to search math? You know, when people talk about searching math uh, in the digital library, uh, they're usually talking about equation finding. Okay, so I type in this humongous math ML or LaTeX uh, equation, and I like to find that equation, or find variants of that equation using some tree syntax about what the equation looks like. Now let me ask you, when's the last time you typed in an equation into a search engine? Yeah, I get a lot of blank stares. I'm not surprised, right? It's almost impossible to type an equation into a search engine, and it's almost impossible to the search engine give you a useful result. So part of the research that we did for this is to discover that people don't want to search equations, but they want to see the results of the search, right? So if I type in Pythagorean theorem, it should retrieve pages that have a squared plus b squared plus c squared, or some variant of it, an isomorphic variant like x squared plus y squared equals z squared, and it shouldn't matter whether we write that in uh, uh, mathematical notation or in natural language. They're equivalent, right? So we would also like to be able to do that. Right? And in math search, actually, what comes out very important is that there are a lot of people doing math search. Uh, it's not just professors and graduate students. There's all the, the, the people at the K through 12 level if you're using the US curriculum guideline. Okay? And that means supporting all of these you know, 10 year olds, 15 year olds trying to look for math materials on the web. Right? So if you wanted to build a math search engine, you actually have to do a lot of work at being able to say something about the specificity, the experience level of that person. And, and maybe not uh, asking someone to fill out a user profile, but more about uh, giving that information in the search results, right? So telling people that uh, here's the definition of the Pythagorean theorem, here's a, a, a search result that has a proof, here's another one that has a, a problem set. You may be interested in problem set because you don't know how to solve the problem, I just want to copy from a solution, right? So resource categorization becomes very important in specific domains. I'm going to argue it for another domain of nursing. So in nursing, we also have this problem, right? And nurses and doctors are extremely busy. There's no way you can afford to bother them with their time. And in a nursing ward, they're constantly taking care of the same type of patients, discharging them all the time. But there's a problem. You don't have time to keep up with what people actually have to say about their current cutting-edge research. How do you fix that? Right? Well, one way we can fix this is to be able to um, give key metadata about that work right at the search result level, right? We want to know whether it's a clinical trial. We want to know what type of race, gender, age group is being treated. So I can match that with the patients in my ward. You know, if it doesn't match the patients in my ward, I don't care, right? But literature search engines don't do that. How can we get there? Well, language and speech, right? We can mine that information, uh, search the metadata, insert that metadata into our search uh, engines, and make it feasible to filter on that. So here's a, a page that you might be familiar with. Um, this is uh, Shri's uh, current uh, Google search engine results, Google Scholar results. And um, I want to illustrate this for citation analysis purposes. So again, apologies to Sri for being a guest uh, uh, appearance or cameo in this talk. But uh, let's take a look at this paper here. This is not a journal paper. This is a conference paper. Uh, it's 360, uh, 355, uh, 356 citations to this since 2004. But uh, what we want to know is, you know, not this rough granular information. You know, how how many times has it been cited? 
But what do they refer to when they cite the paper? Right? Are they talking about the whole paper? Are they talking about the title? Are they uh, looking at a specific research angle or method that was reported in this paper? And also, why? Why do people cite it? Oh, is it because Sri is that famous, so everyone wants to cite Sri's paper? Or is there a specific methodology that he's pioneered that is useful for the foundation of my work? Right? So all of these different citation functions have different meaning. And it's very important for us to tease apart those things, even if it means introducing uh, methods to do so. So in citation provenance, and this is uh, what we're aiming towards. So on the left-hand side here, sorry, we have a claim uh, made by this paper that the aspects of mat uh, matrix factorization models have shown great benefits in prior studies. See it, uh, Ding et al. 2006. And you know, most of us in the digital library, we, if we actually care to find the provenance for the citation, we have to go download it, right? But of course, if we have good linking and we have good natural language processing, we could see something on the right, right? This is an excerpt of that exact paper, which is uh, uh, similar, you know, using cosine similarity or some type of edit distance to what you see on the left, right? So we can tie these two papers together directly in the digital library so that we can read without needing to divorce the context. We, because all of us know the literature is not you know, 1.1.1 point, one point. It's tied in a web of knowledge, to use ISI and Thomson Reuters phrase. Right? So we want to be able to, uh, to enable all of that, because actually, when we studied citations, we were surprised. A lot of people cite without knowing what's in the paper at all. So you get the citations that have nothing to do with the source paper. It just happens to have a couple keywords that match what you're looking for. Okay? And, and that's not very good practice for us because as researchers, we depend on these linkages to be meaningful. Right? Otherwise, we could have used Google, Google to do it, right? Wouldn't have been very helpful. So let's go on to something a little bit higher level. Uh, scientific documents. How do you summarize them? Why not just use the abstract? Like I said before, the abstract is somehow just one measure of importance. This is what the author feels is important about their paper, right? But we've also noticed in the last uh, five years in the natural language community that actually citations matter a lot, right? They tell us what the community eventually thinks is important about this paper, right? You could say, oh, this, this method is really good. And by the way, I created a corpus, okay? And then everyone else is like, oh, you created a corpus. I don't care about your method. Let me get the corpus, right? And, and now I think a lot of us realize corpus creation is a very, very important fundamental part of research, and it needs to be better uh, elevated in terms of respect. And actually, when you're trying to summarize science, it's actually important to think about what piece of information you're putting in there. So this is not published work I'm sharing with you anyways, but uh, when you look at methods, you know, uh, uh, authors' own work is quite voluminous about this, right? They have paragraphs and paragraphs. It's hard to find a single sentence that says, what was it that they used to do this work, right? That's not hard to find if you look at citation sentences, right? People have distilled it so that they can talk about their own work, right? But if you want to find out the methods, how well did it do? What's the F measure? What's the mean error rate? You want to compare papers across different areas that use the same data set. Well, then you're sunk, right? You can't use citation sentences for that. You have to go back to the full text, not the abstract, to find that piece of knowledge. Right? So actually using all of these different networks of knowledge, putting together all of these different texts are critically important for what we want to do for automation, but what we do every day as researchers. So we have some related work. Uh, work. It's a little bit meta because it's on related work summarization. The idea is to take a relate, uh, paper, remove its related work paper, and generate it using natural language processing. Does this sound really sketchy? It is. Yeah, it's not easy to do at all. But what we found from this uh, work is that you can basically have some canonical structure that's generated by um, some type of a template uh, for much of the argumentative purposes of creating a related work summary. But the details of the papers need to be pulled from citation sentences and source sentences in the document. And so it becomes feasible to construct a, uh, a substitute uh, of a related work section. Of course, there's a lot of work to do here. For example, if you wanted to uh, 
properly position the related work with respect to the current work, you would need to understand how the argument of your work is being portrayed, right? You want to paint weaknesses of previous work, right, in uh, conducting what you're talking about. So um, as was introduced, I am the caretaker uh, of the ACL Anthology. As some of you may know this resource if you are working in NLP or speech. Um, it is the Association of Computational Linguistics Archive of All Works. And I got this question over lunch. Uh, it happens to be open access, unlike IEEE, unlike ACM. All of your proceedings there are free for you to use. Okay, As scientists, we don't do any royalties. We copy left it under Creative Commons. Okay, so this presents a really nice corpus which is not encumbered by licenses for us to study our own language, right? I mean, some of us here are language researchers, we're speech researchers as well. Why don't we study our own language, right? So we compile, uh, at least by Google Scholars count, 15 of the top 20 proceedings and venues in, uh, uh, in NLP and CL, and there are about 30,000 uh, publications there growing at about 10% per year. So uh, one thing that I wanted to show you about this interface is that uh, as of this year, we've started a system to uh, create machine-readable formats of literature. So uh, using a very simple uh, uh, LaTeX to uh, HTML methods, we have created uh, a resource that allows us to look at papers that have um, an XHTML representation of that. So I'll just uh, pull up one of these. In fact, I'm just going to click to it here. So this is HTML, um, and so it's easy to scrape. Uh, we have all the figures and the, the tables from this, and it becomes up to us as uh, uh, analyzers of video, image, and text how to make sense of all of that, right? How, how do we uh, make sense of the, the figure caption, uh, the figures itself, to make uh, search engines that allow us to introspect into our papers. So um, with this uh, machine-readable layers, uh, we are building uh, a framework, an API, to allow people to automatically annotate with their systems, right? They can pull down using REST API papers and then use REST APIs again to push up the metadata. Here are the calculated key phrases. Here are the um, um, other enriched keywords for a figure or uh, linking uh, papers to each other. Here are other suggested papers if you want to read uh, after this one. So our group has been trying to tackle this from a harder problem. What happens if you don't have LaTeX, right? If you have just PDF, right? A lot of us uh, have actually discarded our original source files or uh, they've been lost. And the only thing of record of note is PDF, right? And that's un very unfortunate. I, I caution all of you, please save your source for your, your documents because they will be necessary. Uh, but uh, if we don't have that, what we have at NUS as a service to try to recover what people in uh, scholarly literature is the cow from the hamburger. Not a very pleasant analogy. I apologize for that. But you get the idea. is that uh, you've processed all of this, distilled this to a PDF, uh, a printable, a readable format, but not at all amenable to machine analysis. So what we have done is to create a service that will try to undo some of that damage that's done uh, to be able to link references to each other using something like reference string parsing, to be able to find the citation markers as uh, Cite CRX and other systems do, but also to be able to align headers to each other. So if you call an evaluation section evaluation, or you call it experiments, or you call it discussion, and you can align all of those together, that makes it easy to uh, extract results from various papers and compare them uh, in, a, in a framework. And also offer affiliation matching, which is important for those of you who are interested in bibliometrics. So the second half of my talk uh, is about teaching. And I'm doing this right now, hopefully. Uh, I'm not uh, putting you to sleep. You can see most of you are still awake and paying attention, and that's great. Um, but uh, yeah, here is another uh, apology to Sri. We come to these types of presentations all the time, right? You're here in Penang. You should be outside enjoying the sunshine and the seaside, but here instead you're stuck in this air-conditioned room with me. But we attend these workshops for the purposes of uh, understanding each other's work, right? And a key artifact is the slide presentation, right? All of you who are making
presentations today may have thought, you know, I'm going to make this public on the web so other people can use it. And in fact, that's what I tell my students to do, you know, before they go into a research area, look for slides, right? Because from visuals come uh, a very high level understanding that is cemented later on by text, right? So uh, keynotes are unfortunately not a very good place to draw from, but technical papers are. So some presentations are, are good summaries of the work, and uh, they need to be aligned, not necessarily at the core screen, but more at the finer granularity about what these papers are about. Right? So you have conference proceedings, you have the slides, what can we do with them? Maybe you even have the video uh, taken there in the back, and we'd like to align all of these together. So here's a prototype. This is a, a really old poly, uh, prototype. I apologize for the screenshot. This is of an XML, uh, sorry, uh, a database conference paper um, where we are taking the two different uh, modalities and weaving them in context, right? So if you imagine yourself as a researcher, you want to see the slides, but at some point, um, you know, I've looked at the slides. I want to see where these results come from, right? Uh, okay, so I'm going to switch it from uh, slide modality to text modality. And then I have the elements of the text right there. You know, I can drill down and see what are the results that I'm talking about. And I'm able to you know, seamlessly, well, semi-seamlessly, go through these two interaction levels. All right? So we, we think, you know, just like the web of papers, there's a web of artifacts connected with a paper, too. There are papers, there are their presentations, there are their videos, there are their data sets, there are the citations. So we've done some work on this, and here's a call to arms. We are a natural language processing researchers uh, in our group, not multimedia. So I appeal to all of you, that this is a worthwhile challenge to solve because you could use it every day. Right? So instead of having them um, you know, as separate modalities, we'd like to output some type of alignment map that allows you to see both of them together. And then by analyzing a corpus of uh, slides that we've gotten from the database communities, we find a lot of slides are, uh, you know, shouldn't be aligned like thank you slides or outline slides, but quite a lot of them are image slides. There's almost no text on this. Even if you're a superior natural language processing researcher, you would have a very tough time aligning these slides. And there are also drawing slides, which are almost the same as image slides, but they have little snippets of text. Right? And you can see this here, right? You can see um, all of these textual labels here. And if you send that through an OCR recognition system, you'll get all those small labels, but you won't get intelligible text. Right? And uh, what happens is if we send this through a very simple text-based alignment, which is basically looking at the cosine similarity of uh, text in the paper, text in the slides, and we try to align them together, it's not surprising that image slides are the worst, right? But they are the ones that convey the most meaning. I mean, if you're just to align the text, I could read the paper anyways, right? Why bother with the, the images, right? So in fact, it's very important to use multimodal analysis to analyze what is on the slide, right? What, what, what are those charts that you have there? Can I recover data points from them? Can I compare to another chart done by another professor or another graduate student? And so actually, a lot of these uh, 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 errors belong to really critical pieces of information that you need as a researcher when you're trying to replicate, when you're trying to compare with others' work, right? Um, and even at the very beginning levels where we're trying to make sense of the research, those are important artifacts to comprehend. So uh, slide alignment um, is uh, actually quite uh, easy to do from a monotonic standpoint because speakers usually don't jump around too much. There is a caveat, though. Sometimes in papers, related work sections appear at the end, or they don't appear at all in talks because of the lack of time, especially with short papers. So there are all of these artifacts that you need to uh, pay particular attention to if you're working in this uh, uh, ballpark. So our, our architecture for this system was really simple. Uh, we did a very simple uh, slide image classifier. We didn't do anything fancy using just a histogram of gradients to try to determine that. Uh, probably not the best, uh, but that's what the student chose. Um, and uh, using that, we're able to do some alignment. We were able to say that this part of the paper aligns to this artifact in, in the slide set. We can weave these two modalities into each other into the prototype that you saw earlier. Okay, 
So I also want to talk, just spend a couple minutes talking about another area of teaching, I think, which is coming to fruition. So um, this is about MOOCs. We all know and heard of massive online open, open online courses, right? So um, the fact is, when we teach at the university level, or even at the K-12 level, we're teaching to a small group of people, but that's changing, right, with technology. Um, and it becomes even more critical when you consider scale to think about technological devices, tools, that can help um, the much uh, impoverished uh, teacher, right? If you're participating in a MOOC, you have massive, massive uh, student-to-faculty ratio. I'll just take a couple uh, seconds here to relate a story by Andrew Ng when he gave his invited talk at EMNLP last year. So he said, you know, uh, I was recording my lecture in my home studio, um, and I, you know, spent 15 minutes, dashed off a small lecture, published it to, to uh, YouTube when it was back on YouTube. And then I came back an hour later, and then I found out, you know, I had enough views to consume 50 man years of my life, right? So in that 15 minutes, he took up 50 man years of other people's lives, you know, in, in creating that video and disseminating it. And so you can imagine how, how awkward he felt. I was, you know, I was just doing it for 15 minutes. I hadn't even had my coffee yet. I wasn't at my optimal. How could I waste 15, 50 years of people's lives, you know, uh, giving a, a lecture about some part of machine learning? Oh, it would be better if I had spent some more time on that. Okay, so there's really rich, rich, rich masses of textual data and video data that's out there that's going to be available on MOOCs. Some of them are encumbered, some of them are not, but in any case, MOOCs are there to stay. These are really, I think, very, very interesting problems that I would like to call the attention of the multimedia uh, uh, video processing, signal processing community to, because uh, this is where it matters for us as educators, right? We want to educate our, our, our citizenry, educate our, our next generation professors and researchers, and this is where, where the battle is. So uh, we have one research project uh, on this, and we don't have any results here, so I don't have that much to show you. But uh, let's consider the average uh, MOOC forum. Okay, so if you were to go to Coursera, you take a look at some of the forums, they have literally hundreds of thousands of posts, and these are not by spam robots, okay, these are by actual human live beings, uh, bothered to put in, you know, why don't they understand this, etc. There are occasional flame wars, but most of them are, are meaningful. They're signal compared to noise, right? So, um, you know, there's a lot of data there. There's obviously a, a huge investment of man hours, women hours in, in making those resources. Can we do better? So instructors have a limited amount of time. How could they best participate in their own courses forums, right? You want to say, let's have a, a search engine, shall we? Um, that gives a ranked list of which threads, which posts are most urgent to reply to because those are the ones where the most uncertainty among your masses of students are, right? And you can put this in any context you want. All of you belong to educational institutions. You use always some type of ICT framework to uh, present uh, lecture materials and, and discussions to, right? How could we do this better, manage our time effectively? And uh, furthermore, at NUS, we have two professors who uh, participated in Coursera. They have very different styles of trademarks for uh, participating. One participates all the time. Their team was incredibly tired after their MOOC, right? Because they had to spend so much time, you know, hand-holding all of these students, intervening on all of these forums and participating. And the other instructor said, you know, the forum is for peer learning, right? Who am I to intervene? You know, I'm sure all of you as lecturers have had this case, you know, you intervene on a discussion thread and certainly no one talks anymore. What happened? The, the, the professor answered. There's nothing to say anymore, right? How, how, how damaging is that to, to discourse and, and, and um, uh, pedagogical methods for uh, learning and teaching, right? The professor has said, stop, don't need to ask, right? So we'd like to be able to answer these higher level questions with uh, uh, research like this to uh, use natural language processing or other types of research to enter in. So here's a, a case where, again, I can appeal to all of you in the language community at least that this is a worthwhile problem is because Coursera and other cases are giving away free training data. You know, this is a massive data set, 
right? And you're getting data for free. So for our particular problem, uh, uh, Coursera has recently introduced this thing called an errata thread. It means as part of any uh, course, there's automatically a forum for reporting uh, misunderstandings or uh, problems with slides, okay? And it's a pre pre-formatted uh, thing. So you can see here, uh, there's a problem and a typo or a mistake on this page. This is just one category out of several that people have to choose from. So you already have uh, information that all of this text here is about this particular class of problems, right? Who says supervised classification, right? So that's very easy, right? And so uh, they've also given you some type of uh, information about the type of problem or uh, how, how, how you can go about solving it. So uh, the underline also points out something, right? Uh, as that we can train classifiers on text, okay, to look for other types of text, right? To say that, you know, even if you didn't point, uh, write this in an errata thread, or let's say I train a model of errata and I use it for my own ICT solution outside of Coursera, could I apply it? Sure, certainly. But also, because we have other information, like for example, these underlines here, they say, for example, I'll read it to you because it's not very legible. Uh, question 9, question 13, slide 5 of lecture 6, okay? These are all what? They're hyperlinks. They're hyperlinks into our, 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 our slides, our lectures, right? But they're not enabled, right? So as researchers, we have the chance of making these hyperlinks, right? And as multimedia researchers, later on, we can say, now we have this incredible bastion of annotated data to say that these were the parts of the lectures that people cared to write textual annotations for, okay? Even before I create a forum, I can already automatically discover what parts of my lecture would be meaningful. So I also end, want to end with uh, a really short uh, clip uh, that was done by an allied professor at NUS. And so uh, this is related to Khan Academy. Who here knows of Khan Academy? Okay, so several of you. This is a really good resource for those of you who have children for teaching uh, you know, mathematics, but many other subjects. So uh, Salman Khan, and the innovator of this, he got a, a Microsoft grant from, uh, not Microsoft, the, the trust that uh, Bill and Melinda Gates run. Uh, to, to make this uh, or, uh, uh, Khan Academy site bigger. But basically what he does is he makes short YouTube videos about certain subjects. And, uh, you know, it can be about math. But uh, very interestingly enough, he treats the, the, the YouTube as very low-tech uh, solution. So he just treats it as a blackboard, you know, with colored pens, etc. But this um, helps in many ways, okay? It's not a slide lecture as we would normally give in a presentation like this but uh, it affords other types of navigation. So YouTube, of course, uh, you may know, has created an um, uh, automatic captioning system. It can build transcripts automatically from the speech output. And you see that here on the bottom, right? So all of these things, I'll just tell you what the cosine of pi over four is. Sometimes it's right and sometimes it's not. But somebody trying to quickly jump, let's say I have a, a fourth grader who's trying to jump to the specific part has to read this entire transcript in order to figure out what's going on. Meanwhile, the board, as you can see here, is filled with lots and lots of symbols, and you can see exactly which one you want to talk about, but somehow you can't jump to that part. So what he has done is to create Note Video, which was a, a Kai paper this year, uh, which allows you to uh, automatically jump to the part of the video where that particular Blackboard notation was being introduced. So I'll just uh, end with this clip here. It's very short, so it's a teaser, unfortunately, so you don't get the full technical details for that. So you can see here, you can just click on any part and it'll jump to that part of the video. The transcript is also localized. Yeah, so uh, again, apologies, it's not the full clip. But I, can, I hope you can get some sense of what's possible out there when you're talking about multimedia in terms of uh, teaching methodologies. I think those are really important ways that we're going to see in the future. 
So I just want to sum up. I know we're running a little bit of behind time. So I'd like to say, uh, give you a call to arms as those of you in the speech, language, and audio. Uh, you know, text is certainly a predominant form of teaching, but it definitely is multimodal. Uh, image, video, audio, all feature in this. Uh, maybe text is uh, the easiest uh, compressed way of getting information, but certainly all of the other characteristics are important to make a holistic sense. Right, so we can think of all of those things that I talked about at the beginning. You know, watching, trying to make understanding of it, that's video. Then slides and documents trying to comprehend. And then finally, looking at the finer grain levels, so looking at figures and, and data sets, comparing and writing, those types of synthesis skills are also at work. And specific challenges, I think they're at all levels, just like Sri also illustrated in his keynote. Just the ground break, uh, groundwork, recovering clean data from noisy, you know, because we have lots of noisy data in many ways. We don't cite the same way, we don't use the same language. But then being able to build search management and standards and offering tools to make this type of data more widely available, more useful to end users. And to also finally, at some higher end, build insight, right? Be able to build forecasting tools, synthesis tools to support, to support and not supplant using, again, Sri's lecture earlier, uh, the scholar. So with that, I'd like to just end. Let's be narcissistic. Let's care about ourselves a little bit more, okay? And, uh, uh, and understand that we will always have the full spectrum of data as we have in any type of multimedia context. We'll have clean data, noisy data, we'll have conventions that people create to help ourselves learn from automatic tagging, and that to be able to build uh, tools that can help us understand our lives better. So thanks you all for listening, and uh, I'd like to also thank all of my fellow WING members whose uh, work I've uh, compressed in this 40-minute uh, segment. Thank you very much. Any questions? Fine. Just a um, we talked about it was just something that occurred to me because we spent a couple of hours on the slides in my my presentation. Um, you have here a means to look at the paper, extract the necessary uh, information. You could also think about extending this and um, to, to, to extract what is uh, the, the information, the core information of paper, and then structure it automatically in, in a pedagogically better, uh, well, uh, well structured uh, way for a presentation or for a course. It's just another application of, uh, I don't know if you've thought about it or probably it's in your, in next on your to do list. Yeah, there are certainly lots of people who have thought about this question. Thanks for your question first. It's a very good one. Uh, there has been work in the community before to try to make summaries more accessible. So just the notion of a structured abstract, right? So in medicine, we see this a lot. You know, people divide up their abstract into this particular parts so that we can see this. So we'd like to also be able to do this for us, uh, you know, other types of knowledge, let's say our computer science papers, to divide up, you know, what are the key methods or the key results from a paper and make that accessible. In fact, we're working on a, a Google Chrome extension that will allow you to look at Scholar and then retrieve, let's say, the, the um, structured abstract that we would generate from the paper uh, alongside with the, you know, the search results that we get from Scholar. So that's a very good question. Very nice talk. Thank you. Um, so, in fact, uh, I was, my question is also related to that you know, in terms of uh, almost creating personalized narratives. Because you know, once you sort of index and organize the data, then you can actually, you know, the possibilities, particularly for pedagogical reasons, right? How every learner uh, sort of uh, views information or you know consumes information, uh, particularly also it's dynamic, right? As they're learning, it changes. So the same paper you read you know, once or then after, like they read it a little later, the same paper, related papers, the 
the kind of views you get and the kind of uh, comprehension you know, sort of, you know, uh, that uh, emerges is going to be different. So I, I think uh, you know, my question was related to that, you know, in terms of creating uh, almost uh, personalized narratives out of this, uh, uh, this information. What, what you're doing is basically transfusing sort of one view that the authors presented into some sort of a normalized view and then expand it out, you know, almost like your uh, hourglass sort of metaphor is a very good one. Yeah, I think that's a really good insight. That's something that I think a lot of analytics that are being done at um, uh, Coursera and Khan Academy are, are moving towards. They have personalized dashboards for the teacher, but also for the student or the guardian looking after their children uh, on how to learn. But certainly we could extend it uh, you know, to scientific scholarly knowledge, even at this tertiary or beyond tertiary level, to say that you know, uh, beginning researchers would have a library of papers that they understand and to use that as some type of uh, profile of that person when they go into Google Scholar or, or MSRA's uh, uh, academic search, right? To be able to say, these are the papers, why did I recommend them for you, and how did they improve incrementally on your knowledge that you already know? So uh, I think we're, we're not that far away as, as uh, you might expect from that because uh, there are lots of inroads to do that. Part of it is standards, and part of it is just gumption. You know, people trying hard problems and, and trying to get it work. Okay, thank you very much, Profin. Thank you very much for having me. That is uh, speaker-related processing multimedia, and the chair is uh, Dr. Rabier.